Did Jesus really die for people's sins? I mean, the narrative sets it up like he is literally going to replace the sacrificial system. The gospel narrative seems to imply this temple destruction. We're going to delve into Pauline literature and who the heck is Paul? He seems like an ancient Benny Hinn. He has this magical way of interpreting the Hebrew scriptures, whether he was using a Septuagint version, I don't know, but I know that Rabbi Tobia Singer likes to show you some very interesting things that I missed over and over as I read these texts. I never for once said, dang. Paul is doing some weird, wacky reasoning off of these, what Christians call, Old Testament texts. We're going to go into a variety of ideas. A lot of it is looking at how the book of Hebrews or Paul may interpret some of these things, and how is the New Testament authors using the Old Testament, or Hebrew scriptures as you'd like to call them, and comparing the Hebrew Torah, or Hebrew Tanakh, if you will, over with this Greek is, are, did they really corrupt it? Guys, stay tuned. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Don't forget to like and comment down below your opinion, your thought, or what facts you have to bring to the table. We are Myth Vision. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, your host, Eric Lambert, and I brought you back the second coming, the return, the king of the Jews, Rabbi Tovia Singer. How you doing, Rabbi? Oh, it's a big pleasure to be on with you. Thank you. And I, I love getting messages when I go on air. What happens is that Satan, <laughs> Satan knows this. And it's, it's so it's Lucifer, but we're not going to talk about it. It's great to be back. Yeah, I'm glad you're back, too. I want to go ahead and tell everybody up front. Let's get right into this because this is super important. Um, I want to tell our audience that the reason why I'm actually having you on, I'm asking for, you know, a variety of different topics we're going to cover. And I don't want anyone to think, hey, you're just on here just to bash uh, Christianity and Christians. Um, you have very many friends that you have told me that are Christian. But why is it that you do what you do? And that might help my audience understand why you're on here discussing why these things are. Yeah, so my, my life is devoted to countering the efforts of evangelical Christians who are targeting Jews for conversion. So if Jews for Jesus never existed, I would never be doing this kind of work. But given that there are thousands of missionaries worldwide, that are specifically targeting Jews for conversion, I've devoted my life to responding to their efforts in a way that's meaningful. And I've been doing that for not quite 40 years, but for a long time. Yeah, and I, I actually saw a few of your videos, and I personally you know, deconstructed from Christianity for other reasons. But nonetheless, I said, I'd like to have this guy on the show. You know, The show is not a, um, sorry to say it, we're not Christians here at this show. Um, I'm not against Christians. I entertain people who do believe in, you know, God and, and have Christian ideas even that come on my show. But it, the last thing this show actually entertains is anything evangelical in nature. And uh, I'm interested in like secret stuff. Like, is there any celestial mythology? Is there interesting different things that people who come on? But I actually had an interest with you because I said, you know, I'd watched some other guys and they said, if you really want to know things that are wrong with other religious views, ask other religions. So mm. like, if you want to know something wrong, let's say with the Muslim faith, you could ask a Christian or you could ask a Jew and they'll definitely point some issues out with that particular faith. That's... Not every Jew. I mean, most Jews will go, I am out of here. I'm, I'm not, not, not this Jew. So go ahead. Continue. Just let the show run its cycle. Yeah. Run. Like, yes. Yes. Go ahead. I'm about to start speaking in tongues here, you know? Yes. I know. I'm, <laughs> I'm set to that. Well, I want to ask a very basic. Let's start simple and just let the let the Holy Spirit overrun the Satan in this situation here. Why are you not a Christian? Isn't Jesus the most Jewish thing you could be? <laughs> um, I'm yeah, being funny, but I mean, it's like like saying that isn't Bernie Sanders the most Jewish thing you can oh. be? 
So there's this no relationship uh, between the core teachings of the church and what is promulgated throughout Tanakh, throughout the Jewish scriptures. In fact, the core tenets of the Christian religion are opposed by the prophets of Israel. If there were no Jewish scriptures, then you couldn't believe anything. The problem that the church always had to deal with is that its ideas that a person could die for somebody else's sins. I mean, imagine any country applying that. Innocent people die for the sins of the wicked. Uh, the, the Bible tells us, Scripture tells us, Tanakh tells us, Ezekiel tells us, chapter 18, that the innocent person cannot die for the sins of the wicked. A man cannot be God, uh, neither can a statue. Why? Because the Torah says so. So the core, it's not like, I'm anti-Christian, like I just don't like Christians, so I think you touched upon that. It's that the we have a Tanakh of Jewish scriptures that are filled with prophets that preach the word of Hashem, and the ideas that are that are conveyed by the church are utterly incompatible with the teachings of Isaiah, utterly opposed by the teachings that are found in the five books of Moses. It's really that simple. I got a question because, you know, you've done a lot of research. You know more about the Bi the New Testament versions and stuff than a lot of Christians that I actually talk to that I know. And it's like, well, if you're doing what you do, you kind of have to. But my question is, do you agree? I mean, do you separate the thought of church and the church history of how they interpreted the New Testament versus maybe the primitive, more first, second century Christians that maybe had their own text there? the more Jewish sect of Christianity that maybe originally was involved. Do you think, uh, can, do you separate that church, their ideas sure. from that? And then what are the problems with the text? I mean, cause isn't it what we're really trying to get after fundamentalist Christianity says the text is what teaches us. We got to go back to the text. What's wrong with the text versus we know the Catholic church has done atrocities and, and just, I mean, you could look at him and go, eh, come on, man. You're practically like Greco-Roman Jesus. I don't know. It's weird. But the text itself, what are the issues with the New Testament text? You mentioned one of them, an innocent man cannot die for the sins of other people and actually take away their sins. It's like, you're going to go die for me, and I just murdered someone or something. But what other issues with the New Testament text would you point out? All right, so I heard two questions here. Number one, you asked about early Christian sects. Um, it should be like, uh, presumably you meant the Ebionites and, and yeah. uh, groups like that. So first it should be said that none of the writings of the Ebionites survived. Everything we know about them is from the church fathers. And we have an extensive, we have extensive writings about that. Um, the key is that there's such an evolution of, of thought. Uh, the Ebionites would have considered Paul their chief opponent, so they would have rejected not only all of Paul's writings in the book of Hebrews, they would have rejected uh, Matthew, Mark, and John because they those books taught uh, uh, because, you know, well, let's just say Matthew and Luke, the, the virgin birth, and so on. They would have rejected so much of this. So we could see the evolution of ideas even in the Christian Bible. The earliest writings in the New Testament, the letters of Paul, there's no virgin birth, uh, there's no born in Bethlehem. The same thing could be said about Mark. Now you talk about changing texts. That's everywhere in the Christian Bible. The, the New Testament is quoting extensively from the Jewish scriptures, but it is altering the Jewish scriptures so that it, the texts appear Christological. And because hmm, virtually no Christian could read the Jewish scriptures in its original language, virtually, it's almost unheard of. So therefore, almost, virtually every Christian is relying utterly on translations and Greek translations that are given the name Septuagint, and therefore they're completely vulnerable to these to these startling mistranslations. We would find the the largest number of these quotes in the book of Matthew. Uh, the book of Matthew engages in what's called 
uh, fulfillment citations where Matthew says that not only was Jesus born of a virgin, which Luke also says, but Matthew says this is not an arbitrary event. But in fact, in chapter 1, verse 23, this is a fulfillment of what it says in Isaiah. And then presumably we're told that uh, that it says in the prophets um, that behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. That's exactly what it says in Matthew 1, 23. When we go back to the original text of Isaiah, there's nothing like that. The word for virgin isn't there. That's the whole point. Uh, the articles are changed. The, the passage is completely ripped out of context. I, Isaiah chapter 7 is describing a, a civil war between the northern and the southern kingdom. The southern king, there's a king, Ahaz. I always tell people, read it for yourself. And Isaiah is showing him that these two kingdoms, the northern kingdom with and its alliance with Syria, are going to fail, going to be destroyed. So this has nothing at all to do with the first century. The word betula, which is the only word in both biblical and modern Hebrew that can convey virginity, is not there. Instead, the word alma is there, which convey, which means a young woman. Tells us that she's young and gender. It doesn't tell us anything else. So Matthew is obliterated the original text. And frankly, you might ask the question, well, how did he get away with this? How did whoever did this get away with it? And the answer is, they did, and they get away with it today. And Christians are still bewildered when they hear this. And when, I, 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 when I'm lecturing the Christians in the audience and I start quoting these things, they're going and they're like shocked to hear these kind of, these, these very serious charges. But they're not going to get this in church, and it's important to go back to the original. So th this is everywhere. The Christian Bible is constantly misappropriating texts, inventing texts that don't exist, or completely stripping of a text of what it's meaning. Paul engages this repeatedly. One caveat, strangely, and this is going to sound counterintuitive, if Matthew and Paul, for example, did not engage in this kind of, of scriptural chicanery, those are very strong words, and I would use a strong word, I just don't have one on hand, many more people would have become Christians, many more Jews might have become Christians. If they would have not played the game of hide the ball, then many people would have, more people would have got caught up in this. But by engaging in this kind of, uh, this, this uh, three card monte, with text, Jewish people looked at these these fantastic claims and and rejected them utterly because you can't possibly believe in a Bible that's that's not that there are mistakes. These are deliberate mistranslations, deliberate alterations. That I'm sure that many of the contradictions in the New Testament could be ascribed to simple errors, mistakes, ignorance. These are not. These are deliberate. See, let's go into I love this because I had two questions that were coming. I just wanted to mention, and maybe we don't even have to comment on this. I'm reading right now Dennis McDonald. Uh, Dennis McDonald actually wrote a book on the Gospel of Mark and others too, like uh, Luke and Virgil. They're just like rewrites of the Homeric epics and the Iliad. And these Gospels really are copying the pagan epics. Okay, so <clears throat> this is another thing that, I could get why a virgin birth would be important in light of a, you know, Hellenized, very Greco-Roman-ish type rewrite in this type of context. But back to some of these points, I'd like for you, if you don't mind, because it's, I've heard it said, some people approached me off air after our last shows, and I figure, well, why not do this on air? It'd be perfect to ask you. They said a lot of people were suggesting, scholars saying, the Septuagint might have, we have an older version of the Septuagint than we do of the Masoretic in, in totality. However, what we found in, in the Proto-Masoretic has been so miraculously preserved, even into what we find in the actual 11th century Masoretic text, there's such a good tradition that it's, that it's kept. You know, the Hebrew writers who've continuously 
passed these things on and done such a good job. In light of what you're saying that there are errors, would you also agree, though, that there may have been a decent version of the Septuagint? Or would you say there were some slight differences and it got really corrupted by the time it got... What's your take on this with the Septuagint, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, so let's organize a few points. Yeah. First of all, we're using the word Mesoratic, and I have a feeling that most of you just won't know what the Mesoratic text means. If we would replace the word Mesoratic text with the Hebrew text, it's okay. much easier to work with it. But I don't want to do that because I, we need to it's, uh, attack this head on. So uh, m the Mesoratic text, it, it, what is that? What does that mean as compared to a Hebrew text? What is Mesoratic text? So as it turns out, the Hebrew language is a consonantal language. Uh, all the 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet are consonants. There are, no, there are, there are no written vowels originally. Right. So imagine a, 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 a sentence in the English language where you just took out every A, a E I O U and sometimes Y, you would just strip that out of the text and all you had were consonants. Well, that's what Hebrew is. That's how Hebrew is originally. However, in the seventh, eighth century, there were efforts to create a written system to supply for for the consonants, to supply a written system of vowels and also trap being the, the musical notes that are uh, that are read in the synagogue. Um, in a written form. So that's what a Mesoretic text is. Mesoretic text is the Hebrew of the text, but then it adds in just dots and lines, and that tells you how to pronounce it. Until that point, until, let's say, the 8th century, 7th, 8th century, it was an oral tradition. People just knew that this is what goes, this is the vowel that goes under this consonant underneath this letter, but it became very important. It's not hard to figure out why the seventh and eighth century be times where people say we need to get this in a written system. So all the Mesoratic texts is there's the Hebrew letters, and then in addition the vowels, which don't interfere with the letters, go beneath it, above it, and so on. Our oldest complete Mesoratic text, the oldest is the Leningrad Codex. That date is 1008. Um, the the earlier codex we have, it's not complete, is the Aleppo codex, very famous, let's say 930. That's what we have that has survived. What has survived is very tiny compared to what, of course, what once existed. Now, when we go, we go back to the Dead Sea Scrolls that were discovered by accident in 1947 and then subsequent caves would be uncovered the the so we're only talking about continents here because this is the dead sea scrolls are essentially second first and second century bce so there's no mesoratic those vowels no one's ever produced that yet to that point so it's strikingly similar. There are mistakes in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Sometimes the scribes would we see correct would erase a word because it was not spelled correctly and corrected. So sometimes there are some errors. But what is very striking to any person studying this topic and the most important aspect of the discovery of Dead Sea Scrolls is how the Hebrew text we have today is virtually identical to what we had in the 2nd and 1st century BCE. That's enormous. So, you know, that's what's, what's conveyed. Now the Greek part. So there was a Greek uh, translation made for what is today Egypt, for Ptolemy, in around the year 256 BCE. We have enormous amount of sources for this. It's called, this is known as known as the Septuagint, the LXX. This was only of the five books of Moses. So we have this everywhere. We have Josephus, Letter Aristides, Talmud, you name it. It's everywhere. We know this happened. That doesn't survive. That's a proto-Septuagint that doesn't survive. We only have 15 quotes of it, 
for in the Talmud in Tractate Megillah 9a. That's it. That's all we have. Subsequently, there will be people will be producing translations of the Torah and the prophets and writings in the Greek language. After all, there were so many Jews who were Greek speaking in North Africa for sure. And there'll be just numerous translations that would be produced. Just like today, there's so many translations in the English of the Bible. NIV, EV, P, whatever, all well, the whole American stand, new American standard. Right. Well, it's everywhere. That's what was going on. They're producing, every, there are different kinds. There's some word for word, some more dynamic. The point is that subsequent translations would not take a new name. They would rather seize that old original name that everybody is familiar with, exactly the equivalent of the King James Version. So imagine if, if, when the NIV is translated, that's 20th century translation, they said, we're going to call that the King James as well. Well, that's what was happening. Now, okay. we have copyright. You can't, you, you can't do that today. Technically, the Queen owns the copyright of the King James. Um, that's what was happening. So all the subsequent Greek translations are called Septuagints, but they're not the Septuagint. That Septuagint never survived. This is the rub. What happens this is, is where church, the rubber hits the road. This right? is the rub. The rub. This is this is where you take a deep breath in. Okay. What church fathers did, and most importantly, Origen, was they produced a Greek translation that would bolster and support these these mistranslations in the Christian Bible. So if Matthew is misquoting Isaiah seven fourteen. They'll go into the Christian, the Greek translation of Isaiah seven fourteen, and in, interpolate the word for virgin in the Greek to back up the mistranslation found in Matthew. In that case, now sometimes they forgot to. It's like you know when thieves go into a house, they want to get rid of fingerprints. I don't know. If, I don't remember if they use what do they use ammonia or bleach or whatever it is. Who oh, knows? Whatever. If you know the answer, then it's not a good idea. It's not a good. <laughs> Oh, I know exactly. Sometimes the, the people just don't rub down, they don't clean all the fingerprints. So we have numerous examples where the Christian Bible mistranslates Tanakh and they never changed it in the Greek. Mm -hmm. So the Greek doesn't help them. So so that's the story behind it. So we use the word Masoretic text, we're just taking the he we want to use simple words. We use the right. word Hebrew text with the vowels that's it so okay because <clears throat> i want to get down to some of these things uh i tried to have D dr bob uh, robert and price come on the show and i was like dr bob if you could can you show us some examples where the new testament purposely is m like literally changing what the old testament's saying now we didn't get into these examples i'd love to do a show where we just like point out exact ex examples because that's what's really you're catching them red-handed, right? Like you gave us an example in Luke 4. Now, someone commented on our video and said, that example is found, I think they said in the Septuagint or something. I can't remember, but they quoted something and they were saying that they had found that that isn't the case, that it does say giving sight to the blind or something. Right. That's the point. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you. This is, this is where, this is the, this is the scam. If we go to Luke chapter 4, verse 16, 17, 18, 19, we go to that text, Jesus, we are told, goes into a synagogue on the Sabbath and reads from the prophet. He's reading from the scroll. And he is reading for Isaiah chapter 61. The point is that Jesus is not reading from the Septuagint. So right. it's not true. It is true. It is so true that the Septuagint, whoever did it, I... Well, I, you know, you'd have to do a lot of forensics. Whoever did it went, we've got to make Isaiah 61 look like Luke chapter 4. So they stuck it into the Septuagint. That's absolutely correct. What people fail to do is go back to, go back to Luke itself. So Luke reveals, displays for everyone to see that the Greek Septuagint actually is is was doing the scam. That's right. It's in the Greek Septuagint, and it's not in. It's 
it's of course not in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We have the Great Isaiah Scroll. The Great Isaiah Scroll, which is on display for everyone to see in the, not just in the Israel Museum, but if you don't want to get on a plane, you can go online. You have the whole is the Great Isaiah Scroll from Cave One. This is second century BC. Right. This Old is, enough for me to, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with yeah, you. Yeah, this goes back to your bar mitzvah. You can see <laughs> Isaiah 61. It's there. It's not, and that, there's no giving sight to, we know what happened. And the Septuagint, the fact that it appears in the Septuagint, illustrates, highlights the point. The Septuagint is a, a scam. It, and it's, it's also ridiculous. The Septuagint has not just translations of, supposed translations of Tanakh, but the Septuagint also has translations of apocryphal writings, the wisdom of Solomon, which is not non-canonical, and almost certainly was originally written in Greek. So what is it, a Greek translation in Greek? So the absurdity of all this, there's just so many problems with the Septuagint, but I don't want to get into mistakes. These are, this are, this is, this is criminal stuff. And, and it's very, very easy to do the forensics on this. Okay, so that's better spelled out than the first time, I feel. And <clears throat> anyone who has an issue, of course, take it up. You know, leave a comment or, I don't know, uh, I'd write me. Let me know your issues. Whatever, that's fine. Uh, but I, I see what you're saying. And here, I guess, where I was wanting to go in, in a way and try to probe a little deeper on this is that is there evidence of differences that are pr like evidence we have of a Septuagint version that goes prior to the first century that supports what we're finding in the new Testament. However, it isn't matching what the Hebrew version is. So technically kind of where my point was to make it simplified, I guess for our audience and maybe make the question easier. Were there different sects like Christianity is obviously not Orthodox in nature, the way that you would view um, your version of Judaism, for example, is there sex of Judaism that maybe stemmed out of a Septuagint version that had gone into different type of traditions and used their Septuagint version coming up with what we start to see in the New Testament? Or is the New Testament just something you're saying the second and, and later? It's obviously paganized. I mean, I know that's part of it, and I'm trying to simplify it, but is there a Septuagint prior to the hands of Origen that I'm trying to say supports the New Testament anyway. Yeah, of course, of course, you have the these texts didn't survive. In fact, Origen's text doesn't survive. We don't have the Hexapla anymore. We have quotes from it, but it's gone. Right. It or just so the viewers understand this, Origen was probably the most brilliant Christian in history. He was a genius. He he was a teenager, and he already was just writing. Jerome, this may be an exaggeration, but Jerome says that Origen wrote 2,000 books in his life. He had a, secretaries all around him. So Origen was a flat-out genius. This is a third-century church father. He was, he was a brilliant fellow. They, he had people are writing scribes around him, just a, a brilliant guy. But most of what he's written doesn't survive today, but he's quoted widely because he was so, he just wrote so much. Now, are there, I want to get to the earlier translations, Greek translations. Please do, yeah. Yeah, so you have the Greco-Roman world. You have Jews who are Hellenized, who had adopted ideas that were, uh, part, were part of the Greek world and Greek thinking. And it could be said that they would be producing Greek translations that would alter some texts, but not in a deliberate or grievous way, just to expand it, to open it in the way that they viewed made sense. I presume, let me, let me rephrase that. If let's say you hired me to translate Tanakh into the English language, I would have to insert so many words in order to make it readable because Hebrew and English are languages of two different species, two different families, just so different. And if what I'm saying appears strange to you, 
take any text that has Hebrew on one side and English on the other, look at the size of the letters, just take any verse, count the number of words in Hebrew, count the number of words in English, probably be three times the number of words. You've got to supply all these words because they're implied in Hebrew. So I'm not suggesting that there weren't other translations that did everything uh, they could to make it more readable and more readable maybe in the in the genre that they understood the text. That you would have to do. The King James, and the King James didn't invent the system, it was the prior system, I think it was the Bishop's Bible that first did this. It inserts, um, the words that are inserted that are not in the original are in italics. Why? Because they're not in the original. So the uh, the King James and the, the um, I think it was the Bishop's Bible that preceded it, uh, use that system as many others do. So that that's all fine. The problem with the Septuagint that you get on Amazon is that that is a Christian product. There's so many alterations. Uh, maybe, I, I think the I, I think the viewers need an examples of this. Let me let me just that's, give you Yeah, a, let's I'm following let's you. Let's take a, let's take a crazy example. Let's just take something. All right. So Jeremiah 31 so Jeremiah 31, there's just a warning here. This is not really important. But this verse, if you're using a Hebrew Bible, appears at verse 30. And in a Christian Bible, it appears at verse 31. They're just the chapters are cut slightly different, are cut differently for reasons that are complete not germane to this. So Jeremiah 31, verse 31, 30 and 31 says that Days are coming, saith Lord, they make a, 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 a covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the old covenant I made with them when I took them out of Egypt, although, although I was a husband to them. That's basically the text. That's really essentially two verses. If you're using a Christian Bible, this will appear as Jeremiah 31, uh, verse 31. Uh, now, the book of Hebrews, as it turns out, quotes this passage. If you had a Christian Bible and you look at Jeremiah 31, 31, it would tell you in a footnote that this verse, Jeremiah 31, 30, 31, 32, is quoted in the book of Hebrews, and it is. In the book of he Hebrews, <laughs> yeah, so the book of Hebrews is essentially one large argument against Judaism. That's its whole, the the whole, the reason why the book of Hebrews was written is to oppose the Jewish faith and to show how all of it's really pointing to Jesus. That's what Hebrews is. In Hebrews chapter 8, this is conveyed explicitly, where in Hebrews 8, we are told, verse, you'd start with verse, just, do you, you have a Bible in front of I, you? I do. I'm ready to read All right. It. All right. Uh, so look look at verse 9. It okay. says, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day that I took them out of the hand, by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they, they didn't continue my covenant and I disregarded them. Something like that. I regarded them not. Yeah, it declares right? the Lord. I rejected them. <clears throat> I rejected them, okay? Right. Okay, so that's Hebrews 8, verse 9. Now, I didn't, Derek, sneak into your house or whatever you're using and change anything that's what it says if you open your hebrews 8 verse 9 this is not uh, you know i'm i'm not david blaine i'm this is not a magic show <laughs> i was gonna say Santa <laughs> this Claus. Is not like i'm not you know now what i want you to do can you hold that place yes and go to jeremiah 31 verse 31 okay okay and and then you have the, the same text, except for a major alterations. N uh, Jeremiah 31, verse 31 or 32, depends on what kind of Bible you're using. Yeah. Do you, tell me when you have it, because I want to read it. it and I don't want to, you got it. Yep. So it says, not like the covenant that I formed with their fathers on day that I took them by the hand out of the land of Egypt. They broke my covenant, although I was a husband unto them. Bam. The original text says in Hebrew, I was their husband. I was their lover. This is a constant 
theme of Jeremiah, that God was the authentic husband of the Jewish people and is using adultery that the Jewish people had failed God at critical junctures. So it's a spiritual adultery. So the text in Jeremiah 31 says that I was a husband to them. I was their lover. Hebrews, not only, it's not like Hebrews has like a different color or different saturation. Hebrews rapes the text. And I'm using that word deliberately, rapes the text. Because the, what Hebrews says is, I disregarded them. Yeah. I rejected them. I don't see a husband That's at the, all in here. No, of course not. Because Hebrews 8 wants you to get this. Listen like you never listen in your life. Hebrews wants you to, the, whoever wrote this book, and it's not that late, this, this is a book written almost certainly in the 60s. The author of the book of Hebrews wants you to believe that the old covenant has been done away with. The old covenant with Israel, with the Jews, is gone, has disappeared. And whatever is old is essentially vanishing. Now, if you think that's my spin, if you think I just don't like Christianity and I'm making this up, that's exactly what Hebrews says. <laughs> so Hebrews 8, verse 9, we read that, and that's a quote from Jeremiah 31. J Hebrews 8 has 13 verses. Take a look at the very last passage of Hebrews 8. So okay. now we're just going to move from verse 9. Let's go to verse 13. Okay. You want me to and, read it or you got it? Well, you, I'll, I'll do it for you. Please do. In that that he said a new covenant, he has made the first one old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Whoa, that's exactly what it doesn't say in Jeremiah 31. So the, when I, what I want to convey is this is not like you, you were talking about could there have been earlier Jewish sects that may have altered it, colorize the text in Greek right. translations. This is, we're not talking about, this is boring. So they, you know, had this type of view, that, that, not interesting. Of course, World War II is taught in schools in Russia and the United, or the United States differently. In Russia, right. they'll talk more about the, of that I get that. This is changing the whole text. That's, that's, violating it's raping the is original this, text is this in both what i mean is this is the uh, the actual hebrew version and the septuagint version that we have not the church one you're you're saying or even let me ask that like the septuagint and the hebrew are they on the same page and this book of hebrews is no both? no the septuagint covers it the septuagint is there with a long black coat going come here just look at my Septuagint. I'm all good because the Greek in the Septuagint, the Septuagint has it. I rejected them. That means the Septuagint was shaped, was molded to support he he the author of Hebrews's mistranslation of the Book of Jeremiah. Okay. Now I'm going to give you an, an another one. Okay. Just a few chapters later, where whoever did the Septuagint doesn't didn't make this cup didn't cover they this messed point. up they they like you said right they okay. didn't to hear the septuagint this is an example i know you're loving this third uh, dude you know this me. <laughs> yeah i know i know so this is an example where the septuagint was whoever did it did a good job that means in the greek in the septuagint it conforms with hebrew so hebrews is covered by the septuagint as it turns out the king james and and every Christian Bible follows the Hebrew, doesn't follow the Septuagint on this. I mean, you open a King James in Jeremiah 31, New Americans, it doesn't make a difference which one you use. All of them back up, maybe with one or two, back up the Hebrew. They don't side with the Septuagint on this, which is really so interesting. Okay, so th that's an I mean, that's the. All right, that's an example. We're going to go to. Um, we're going to go to an, an example. I want to go stay in the book of Hebrews, okay. but I want to go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. Okay. Okay, going to Hebrews the 10. Hebrews 10, verse 5. You want me to do this I in wanna, the King James like you were talking about, or just don't matter? It, it, it wouldn't make a difference. It okay. wouldn't make no difference I'm at go all. I'm the King James uh, for uh, the heck of it. Uh, yeah, yeah, go for it. So, okay. First, I want the uh, viewers of this show to understand the context, Okay. What is Hebrews seeking to do? Hebrews 
wants to explain why there was ever an animal sacrificial system and and what do you need Jesus for? Right. So Hebrews is conveying that essentially the entire sacrificial system that existed, the animal sacrificial system in the Jewish scriptures is essentially foreshadowing. That's an idea that you find in, it's a Pauline idea, that essentially what you find in the Jewish Bible is only a shadow of the few, the shadow of 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 Christ, the shadow of Calvary, the shadow. Of, if what I'm saying sounds weird to you, it means you've never been to church. Oh this no, is, I know all about the types is, and shadows. This, and... Yeah, yeah, <laughs> shadowing. Everybody's a shadow. The shadows here, the shadows there. This is the you know. It's. All right, I think so. Christians are inconsistent too when they come on the scene and they say, "Well, the New Testament prophecies." You know, this is a fulfillment, but that's even just a, a shadow of the real fulfillment that's to come. And I'm like, sorry, if anything was supposed to happen, it, it, this is my opinion, it didn't. But nonetheless, that's a whole different show anyway. So, but yeah. So Hebrews 10 wants you to know that essentially that God really never wanted the animal sacrificial system, but it really was all about Jesus. The whole animal sacrificial system is about Jesus, and it quotes <laughs> from the Jewish Bible, Hebrews 10, verse 5, sacrifices and offerings you did not desire, whatever, I don't know how you're trying to like, but a body you prepared for me. A body you prepared for me. What is that body? Imagine I was sitting in front of a church of 10,000 people. Everyone screamed Christ. Now, if you have, again, not the stuff you're always ripping off from the Holiday Inn, but a decent Bible that actually has notes in it, it would tell you, just so you know, I didn't go, it would tell you in Hebrews 10, verse 5, that this verse is found in the book of Psalms, chapter 40, verse 6. Just so you know, here again, in a Christian Bible, it's verse 6, and in a Jewish Bible, it's verse 7. That's the verse. If we, if you hold Hebrews ten five here, and then go to where it comes from. So going into Psalms, Psalm forty, verse six. And I always pronounce things wrong. By the way, my Septuagint. That everybody hates me pronouncing it, and I literally just rest with an L in the middle. Anyway, I'm here, <clears throat> Psalm 40, 6 through 8. So 40, v verse 6. Verse eight. 6. No, verse 6. That's There it is. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not, prepared, uh, not repaired. Stop the show. The text here says, sacrifices and offerings you did not desire, oznayim karisoli in Hebrew, my ears you have opened for me. King David is speaking uh, that God, King David repented of a very great, grievous sin in 2 Samuel 12. So, and God forgives him without any sacrifices. That's the context. This is a theme in the book of Psalms that's repeated. It's not, you'll never hear this in a church. King David says, sacrifice and offerings you didn't desire, but my ears you opened for me. Okay? The book, imagine you take those words, you put it on a huge screen, you take out your trackball, you select in the words, but my ears you have opened for me. You have now white letters on a blue background. You tap the delete key, they disappear. You then type in, but a body you are prepared for me. And the question is, where did you get that from? How'd you change? How'd you get a body you prepared for me? How does my ears you open for me and the body you prepared for me? How do you change my Bible? How do you? So this is not a mistake. I would submit to you that there's tons of mistakes in like Acts that are just simple, silly mistakes. So the author wasn't familiar with the geography of the land of Israel. Whatever. This is not that. This is not Acts seven. This is this was a deliberate alteration of the text to, to convey to you that the whole animal sacrificial system was all pointing to Jesus. And 
the fact that Jesus died, we don't need the sacrificial system any longer. And in, again, I want you to be sure that the context is applied. If you go down to Hebrews 10, uh, just go down to verse 18, the author conveys that, in fact, the animal sacrificial system is done with, that Jesus is the final sacrifice, mm -hmm. and there will be no sacrificial system in the future. That's the point. Yep. I mean, this the whole point of Hebrews 10, it really starts much earlier. The point of it is all of these things of the past, animal sacrifice, is all pointing to the future of Jesus because these authors also need to explain why did you need Jesus for? Why don't you just keep the animal sacrificial system? Why don't you just keep that going? If what you need is the blood of, of bulls and goats and without the shedding of blood there's no atonement, Hebrews 9.22, then why not keep it? It worked perfectly. So he was conveying that how then could the blood of bulls and goats at down for sin? That it, it was only a temporal system. It's all point to Jesus, all point to the cross, it's all point to Christ, it's all point to Gotha, it's all point to look again. If you grew up in Jerusalem and never met a Christian in life, maybe this will be foreign to you. If you had any uh if you ever been to church in life, then what I'm saying is normal. I'm not, yeah. This is this is every Sunday. Common this sense. Is the, yep. This is standard. So now we can see how this was produced. And that is the Hebrew scriptures were just it's not the it's not were just stripped, ripped apart. And this is the reason why every Orthodox Jewish child in an Orthodox Jewish school anywhere in the world is learning Hebrew. The age of three, four, five, six. Every Jewish Orthodox. Now there are some Jewish people who are who are not observed. There are many Jews in the conservative movement that are reading Hebrew too. But in the yeshiva, every child, every re religious Jewish school in the world teaches children Hebrew, and they all can read it like a newspaper. It's very easy. It's not like English with a language of nearly a million. It's a, it's a very small language virtually no Christian child is taught the Hebrew language in school. There are, in California, in Texas, in Kansas, you know how many Christian schools there are? I couldn't count them. Too none many. of them are, none, there's no Christian child who's learning Hebrew. They, they may, in some prep schools, learn Latin. I don't know who, what is this, what, how is this useful? Learning Latin, why don't you learn the language of the Bible? They learn Greek, but not Hebrew. So if, it's not that Jews are just some smarter. They're taught the Hebrew. Jews read out of a Hebrew Bible. There are translations that we produce because there are many people who convert to Judaism as an adult and so on. It's available. But Christians have no access to the original text. And therefore, they really think, Christians really think that Jews are blinded, right, that we're right. demonic. There's Absolutely. something wrong with them. Why do the Jews, and then they use this word, which is Derek, you know I'm not making this up. They, they use this term like, why do the Jews deny Christ? Right. Like, well, what is that? Can you that? not see him? I mean, he's in your your text. Now, now Rabbi, I got something that, because my, my channel talks about the historicity of Jesus and this really strange thing. I, I saw a post earlier today. I mean, for crying out loud, they had a man, okay, I get there were sacrificial systems in the world where, where animals were sacrificed for people's atonements and such, okay? But why would you go from, we have an animal sacrifice, okay? This guy, and this is one of my big red flags as well, this historical man comes and he comes on the scene, and then you apply the sacrificial atonement system all onto this one guy who supposedly existed in the 30s, which is weird to me. I'm still an agnostic when it comes to whether he existed or not, even though I hear both sides and I hear the good arguments. Just really weird. Why would they apply that? I discussed this extensively in volume one of Let's Get Up and Roll. Okay. Um, it's, 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 it's transparent of what occurred here. You had a person who was some itinerant uh, preacher of sorts, who had a, some small following in the Galilee. And there are people who came to believe that he had some, probably some very important role to play. 
these beliefs would have been completely disconfirmed if he was executed by the empire, by the Roman Empire. And the only reason you'd be crucified is for treason against the empire. Or else they didn't, they didn't waste their time with crucifixion. Crucifixion was to make an example of him. So people came, certainly found that to be appalling and just walked away from it. But other people came to say, well, he was a completely innocent person. He surely wasn't killed for anything he did. He must have died for what somebody else did. Now, that idea would, is alien to Judaism. But that idea was so widely believed in the pagan world. Mm. That's why in the, in the pagan world, whether it, in Central America, in, in, in throughout the Aztec, Levant, you name baby, it, yeah. right, virgins were sacrificed. The, you know, I'm a, I'm a diver, and I've, I've, uh, Mexico has some gorgeous reefs. And they have there the old Aztecs and Mayan altars where they found thousands of girls, young girls, who were so beheaded. Why, now, why did the ancients sacrifice babies, pass them into a fire tour, warns us about that, mm -hmm. and virgins? Like, what? Let's stop and think. So, those babies and virgins were killed in order to appease the gods. So let's think from what do babies and virgins have in common? What do they convey? Innocence. This is this is not it is not rocket science. A baby, oh the baby's so innocent. A virgin, she's innocent. That's what virginity conveys. So the idea in the pagan world that was so deeply ensconced in it is that a virgin had to be sacrificed to appease the gods, and then us people who are not virgins, who are nothing like babies, then the gods will be satisfied with it and forgive us. So what you have is this is a this is an ancient motif, an ancient theme that the the innocent had to die for the sins of the wicked. This idea is so alien. I'm talking about what do you? This idea that the Torah not. constantly says, never do this. Don't right. pass your baby into the fire. Don't kill babies. Don't, don't, um, the innocent person cannot die for the sins of the wicked. Uh, the wicked person, if that person will repent, he will surely be forgiven. In what universe will you, would have that the 19 hijackers of 9-11, they would be set free, but will kill 19 old ladies in Nebraska. So, we, we should reject that kind of thinking. Tanakh is opposed to these core tenets of the Christian faith, so we're making a full circle here. So the ideas of the Christian religion are, is, is very powerful stuff. And I want to just, for another thing, and I've never spent a second as a Christian, but it's become very clear to me that there's something very powerful about someone who's willing to die for you. You know, in your life, has anyone betrayed you i don't need you to answer yeah. that question i guarantee you people broke your heart and i guarantee you derek that the people who broke your heart were not cashiers in walmart they weren't strangers they were people who were really close to you those are the people who now when when you'd been betrayed how valuable were the people who didn't betray you didn't turn their back on you how valuable were those friendships to you very important you began to as you got older you began to go wow good friends who stood by me those are the people i really love the family members who betrayed me the so that is very attractive someone's willing to die for you to give his life for you mm -hmm. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's where it comes from. So understand this. Christianity is very attractive. This is the reason why it's the largest religion in the world. Huge. It's not, it has something very appealing. I'm not a smoker, but I presume that people who smoke are going, they're enjoying it. People who take heroin, they must love it. Whatever it happens, it must be people who are alcoholics. I feel so bad, but it must be fantastic to be drunk. But it ultimately will kill you. Mm -hmm. The Torah is saying there's no question these things will a great pleasure. Well, pork, I never ate it. I'm I'm sure bacon must be 
bewildering. I'm not going beautiful. to. I'm not going to comment. <laughs> I don't know. I'm told that shrimp and lobster is unbelievable. I never had it. It looks like a big cockroach to me. Right. It's, right. To me, it, it's. But people tell me, oh, this is the most you don't know, Rabbi. It's always not saying that these things don't taste good, don't feel good. It's always somebody saying this will destroy you spiritually. Right. Just like a doctor. The doctor's not going to say uh, smoking or doing drugs doesn't feel good. No one will tell you that. Crack must be unbelievable. Right. It's always somebody saying it's going to kill you. It's right. And the ideas that are conveyed in the church, no one's suggesting they don't transform people, make the people feel good. Of course they do. All these religions do. Or else they wouldn't get off the ground. The Torah is simply saying, this stuff is going to kill you. And how do we know it? Because the God of Israel told us so. So I wanted to ask you, you gave a couple good examples in the book of Hebrews showing, look, guys, it's obvious there's changing here. Now, my question is this. Do you think, and maybe you can give us some more examples like what you found in the book of Hebrews, because I know you have a lot of these, I'm sure, but do you think that the author's motives were not bad? That maybe they really believed in what they're actually writing and saying? Because I just interviewed someone that this is totally, you know, irrelevant to the topic here, but Dr. David Scribina, and he believes that Jesus was a hoax. He uh, flat out says Paul was an actual liar, not just that he like did little like white lies for his own agenda, but like the whole thing is a hoax. And I, I wanted to ask you, do you think these authors uh, really believed what they were writing, like the book of Hebrews and other books, and they thought they were really right about this? And if so, why would they think that? So I, I know it's a lot of questions in one, <laughs> but... I, you know, I don't have access to texts that viewers have. I don't have secret texts that I have access to. <laughs> I can't, I'm not a psychiatrist. Right. It's 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 abundantly clear to me when reading Paul's letters, especially the indisputable letters of Paul, that Paul was at war with other Christians by a different Christology. What I'm saying is is very clear because in virtually all of Paul's letters, his enemies are Christians being fellow believers in Jesus who had a different Christology, and that's who he's battling with. He's not battling with traditional Jews. And it's very important to Paul to convey, as an example, that he is right and his information is the truth, and he has it from Jesus Christ directly, and he's a super apostle, and he's the smartest guy in the class, and he's a Pharisee of Pharisees, and he told Peter to his face, this is Galatians 2, Galatians 1, Philippians 3. No one disputes that these letters are from the hand of Paul. And he is saying that what he has is superior to the apostles in Jerusalem. So I don't, you don't need me to go, what do you think? Who cares what I think? Who cares what Toby is saying or thinks? Paul, very transparently, is in the first two chapters of Galatians, wants to demonstrate why the apostles in Jerusalem do not have the authority that he has, that his credentials are the best. He's bulletproof. So you have somebody who just is fighting with everybody. He, he won't travel with Mark. He won't, He's fighting with Peter. He's calling Peter a hypocrite in Galatians chapter 2. This is not Tovia Singer saying that Peter is a hypocrite because he behaved one way when he was around Jews or another way around Gentiles. This is in the book of Galatians. This is, why would Paul need to say that he told Peter to his face? I mean, so why, this is not like what, who cares what a Jew in Jerusalem thinks? This right, is not right. what I think. Paul is so, unlike the Gospels, which are, which you have to tease out. Mm -hmm. It's Paul is very transparent in what he's doing. It's he, Paul. It's like playing poker with him. His cards are his whole cards are open. Everybody can see what hand he has. He's there's nothing hidden. It's, it's all very transparent. There is no Christian scholar in the world that would disagree with what I just said. That Paul is seeking to demonstrate that his. Um, 
Christology is true against who? Against other Christians. And then he marches in the book of Galatians chapter 3, which is the critical chapter, where he goes, who bewitched you, you Galatians? Meaning you're listening to the other Christians, that you need the law. And then, you know, four, five, six, an explosion. Forget about it. So I, you don't need, need to ask me, what do I think, Paul? Would you want to hang out with Paul? No, because Paul was a guy who just didn't get along with the people around him. Paul had to be first. He had to be, I have it directly on and no one else. And who is he pounding against? He's pounding against the premier apostles. He has it over James, a brother. He has it over over Peter. He's got it directly. So you don't need a, you don't need my opinion on this. It's very the other thing is that Paul had no problem just smoking through the Torah, meaning altering it in any way that he sees fit. Let me give you another example, which is so transparent. I don't even understand how any. Let me give you an example. The Torah is very devoted to that there should be justice in the world and that we should treat others properly. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 25 is example. We have a lot of this, including animals. There are many prohibitions of Torah of causing pain and harm, the causing an animal pain. So much so that in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4, the Torah says four words, like saksim, Torah says that when an ox is threshing, you can't muzzle the ox. It's, an, it's a prohibition from the Torah that the animal is, in, is, is working in the field and it's surrounded by the stuff it loves, its food. You can't cause the animal that anguish to muzzle it so it can't eat the food that's around while it's working for you. It's so simple. What happens? Paul doesn't like that so much. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 9, 10, Paul says this. He quotes this passage. You may want to look it up for yourself because it sounds too crazy to believe. Paul goes and quotes this passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 9, 9, 9. So it's okay. easy to remember. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 9. Okay. Okay. Uh, so just so you know that I'm not inventing this, that I'm not reading it out of context, that I'm not, okay? Tell me when you got it. Got it. One... I got it. Ah, Paul then there quotes Deuteronomy 25.4. And he quotes it. It says in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox uh, while it's treading the grain. And then he asks, what, do you think God cares about oxen? What? And then he's going to go on in verse 10. He really means that you support missionaries of the church. What? What, what? So what, imagine I would stand up and I would say, do you think God cares about oxen? No. It means you should send me Toby Singer a donation. You go, <laughs> where the heck did you get that? What, like, what are you doing? Like, what? That's Benny Hinn stuff. That's these these preachers out there that people have no respect for what 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 do you need what what kind of what kind of theology is that and how do you if that's some oral law that paul invented how do you play with my body how do you say do you, do you think god cares about animals he literally asked that question do you think god really cares about animals i didn't put it in there i do i think god really cares about animals how do you like that well, that's see, why we're only allowed to slaughter an animal and so uh, this keeps bringing so, me back to something, Rabbi, it is these people like Paul, they're doing something like so weird. Uh, it's well, I'm not trying to be funny and I don't mean this disrespectful to Christians even, but like Christians do it today. You know, they look at their newspaper. The end of times is about to be here. Donald Trump is the 666. And, you know, there's always like weird stuff that they do and they apply the principle to themselves. They might even reinterpret something. To make sense, even from the New Testament, like not just the way that the New Testament does it for the old, but it's like this weird mystical, I want to apply something and redefine what that context is to my own circumstances right here in the New Testament. And that seems to be what Paul's doing. Uh, 
even if he has to flip it on its head completely, like, yeah, God's concerned about the oxen in the Old Testament, but but here's the thing. You think he cares about the oxen? Isn't this really he, about us? It, right. I mean, you should be supporting us. What? What? If, you, if we can go a little further, this will totally, I mean, I really hope you're sitting down. If we just go a few verses later in the same chapter that Paul says, I just want you to understand how I convert people. In chapter 9, verse 20, same chapter, just go a little further. He I'm says, there. let me explain how I do it. To the Jews, I become a good Jew, that I can win the Jews. Mm. To those under law, I become like I am one who is under law, that I may gain the... To those who are not under law, meaning the Gentiles, right? I become like them. I can become all things to all men so that I may gain some. Well, what is that? That means that's chameleon, that's a chameleon. That means whatever I need to become, this is Philippians 1.18, whether in pretense or in truth, the gospel is preached. It means I will shape myself and mold myself to fit whoever I'm talking to. It doesn't mean that I'm, I'm going to speak Chinese instead of Spanish. It means I'll become like them to sell it. So what, what you don't need to be a psychiatrist. I don't need to say, that I have a theory. The Gospels are much more, um, because the, the, the Paul's letters are likely to be less changed, these letters in particular, less of the Gospels are layers and layers that you really have to tease out. It's very, very interesting. But it's not as simple as Paul. Paul is very clear in what he's trying to do here. Paul is not the guy you'd want to have um, dinner with. He, as well, I said, you the people, know he's fake, or you know he's doing whatever he, he can just for has his to agenda. Be, he, you, you've ever been to a party, and there's one guy who just he's got to be it, and every, and you can't. And that's Paul. Paul's when not, I drank it, it is, alcohol, and, and one, I was like that. But yeah, go ahead. <laughs> and one other thing, I want to, I want to persuade the viewers. Okay, it is inconceivable that this was invented later. It's inconceivable that this is not authentic. Why, if Paul didn't write this, why would someone come along later and insert uh, Paul's calling Peter hypocrite? Why would he make that up? Why would he make up Paul um, being um, so disagreeable with fellow Christians? I mean, it's embarrassing to the church. That is the most, um, the most, um, th that's a, a, the most, um, hmm. It's a method that is the most uh, that is so easy. That criteria of embarrassment is, that is is so reliable. It's inconceivable that someone would have made this up later. Like I believe a lot of stuff made up later. I don't think the prologue in John was written. But whoever wrote John one through one through eighteen, I don't believe wrote John two through twenty. I don't think twenty one was written. But Paul is very clear what's happening here. It's, this is very transparent. You don't need theories on this. Rabbi, it's if you don't mind, that. as a Christian, when I, when I was like a firm believing Christian, we talked about only one place. And, and, and you'll definitely get where I'm coming from with this. It's like taking our, our viewers who might be not familiar with the Christian worldview, but most of them probably are that are watching. The only place I recall contention between Paul and Peter that I was taught at, Sunday school was when it got to circumcision. It was the one place when Peter and Paul, you know, Paul watched Peter be a hypocrite. He calls him out, you know, to his face and he says, listen, you, you know, you're of the circumcision and, and then you're not, you're playing games, uh, you know, making himself look good, making Peter look bad and saying he's been a hypocrite. That's the only place the church ever told me there was a problem between those two men. And what's crazy is they later on say, you know, Peter, Peter realized he was wrong. You know, like Peter, Peter come around, you know, Peter had been duped once. Well, first, before. you have the epistles. You don't need that. You have the epistles of Peter. I don't believe for a moment those were written by Peter. <laughs> but that's the whole point of the epistles of Peter is to say, oh, we're all on the same team. Yeah. Moreover, that's the point of the book of Acts really is this. The poor Acts is written for many reasons, but one of them is say that everybody's on the same page, and everyone was there for the ecumenical council where everyone gathered together, and then these questions were raised, and everybody agreed. That's why Acts 15 exists. 
to later explain what did they get along or didn't. And the epistles of Peter are there to say that Paul was preeminent. It's it's there to explain that all the way, that everyone was on the same team well, Galatians, and there was no problem. The earlier letter of Galatians that you bring up, you brought this up before, you know, James is sending spies, I think Peter's one of them, to spy out Paul's freedom in Christ, as Paul calls it. Why are you doing that? And then why is Paul saying anyone who teaches another gospel, other than the one I teach, let him be a curse, let him be anathema? This sounds competition. This sounds like a problem. And it, like you said, these books come later to fix it. Right. And it's inconceivable, I would submit. I, it would be torturous to believe that somebody later would invent this stuff. I mean, this is embarrassing. Um, this is embarrassing that Paul was, uh, that there was tension between Paul and the Jerusalem church headed by James, that the Jerusalem church would have to call Paul in and say, what are you doing, circumcised Timothy? We hear that you're doing away with the law. And it is, it's it's not, there's no surprise that the circumcision of Timothy is never mentioned by Paul in his own letters. That only appears in Acts. So I, I, wa I want to convince you, the viewer, <laughs> oh, I love that this stuff, there's man. no way, I mean, it's just no sober mind could believe that some scribe added that there was, there was a war between Jerusalem and Paul and and originally that wasn't in the letters of Paul. It's inconceivable because that's embarrassing. And it's everybody is covering that up. I mean, everybody's trying to explain later. Let's just say, especially the book of Acts. <laughs> Certainly. The, so how could you believe that was made up? And, and Paul is in Galatians 5. He is, you talk about circumcision. Uh, you, if you believe this is the word of God, so you believe it. So so from in in Galatians five and six, Paul is screaming. It's a screed against circumcision, and circumcision is the model for keeping the law. And in chapter five, Paul literally says, if "You, I'm paraphrasing a drop here, but you can open up chapter five, Galatians verse twelve. He says, if you I really want it. to do that, why don't you just cut the whole thing off?'" Oh yes, that's really so... like God. God said that. Like this is the <laughs> word of God. Look, God who tells Abraham, circumcise yourself and your children, your family, and the, and and really, really, yeah. God talks that way. It said, "Why don't you cut the whole thing off?" What? The, what is that? That's gutter talk. I mean, what is that? That's that's a guy throwing a tantrum. Yeah, this cut is the, cut the why don't, why don't you castrate yourself? I mean, just cut it all off. I, mm -hmm. uh, if I talk that way to somebody, I think you know, someone who I oppose, and I said something that's such gutter talk, I think people would lose respect for me if I talk that way. This is Paul talking. I'm not. Yeah, I, I didn't go into your house and put it in there. <laughs> really, really, Paul's the word of God, God is a psychopath, God is schizophrenic, that the tire of the Jews are committed to circumcise himself, and he's referring to he's referring to the Jews as the children of 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 Hagar and Christians and these Gentiles, the children of Sarah. Really? Really? That's the word of God. This is the point. I think that people believe that I might be anti Christian. I just look at these texts and I'm shocked by yeah. them christians defend drawn... this stuff right i i understand um, that's it it's just there it is well, rabbi let me let me because i'm with you like i'm with you 100 percent. you know when it comes to this stuff right here it's like to me i'm seeing it for what it is and i'm i'm, I'm yeah i might be looking at books like acts and stuff as cover-ups yes i do agree i'm 100 percent with you on that on that page uh, but there's reasons why we can date these books later, and it's not just these, oh, well, they've got to make sense of it. Let's try and make sure this thing works. No, there's more to why the book of Acts is dated later, etc. Something I wanted to ask you about Paul and maybe his motives. I know you mentioned earlier you're not a, you're not a psychologist and you cannot read minds, but uh, 
previous guests, I tend to sometimes have like a guest on before and then it influences something I think about during the conversation. I like to ask other guests. Um, David Skirbina, Dr. David Skirbina says Paul's motivation in his understanding was to try and get as many people to come in to go against Rome. He believes that Paul actually was against Rome. I thought Paul was for Rome by many of my guests who've come on pointed out clear, like pro Roman high to the house of Caesar, you know, like it seemed like Paul was like getting in close with the pagan rulers of his day and wasn't really true to the, the higher ups in the Jewish, uh, uh, I guess you'd say the people who are in control of Judea and he wasn't on their side. It seems he's going on the other side. Now, this whole getting rid of circumcision message, it's not going to work. This, this, I mean, this pro circumcision message isn't going to work to Gentiles. So obviously he has to change his message up. Is there anywhere like you could give me any thoughts on what Paul, you think his motivations were and why he was doing it? I just want to say that I want to speak directly to this. The Roman empire was, was eclectic and the Roman, the empire as long as what you were doing was not subversive, they weren't um, fundamentalists. Um, the New Testament also is very kind to Rome. Uh, Rome is never held accountable for Jesus' death, and the Jews are. Mm -hmm. And it, it in Pilate, the empire their culpability is is jettisoned and all the culpability for Jesus' death is on the Jews. I'm not just straight away. Just shoot it. Just shoot the it. The <laughs> oldest book, the oldest letter in the entire Christian Bible is almost certainly First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians is widely dated to 4950. Very old. First Thessalonians chapter two, verse fourteen through sixteen, says these words. This is this is so old. That means this is in most Christian Bibles, forty nine fifty. That's how old this is. This is older than First Corinthians. Even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus Christ and the royal prophets, and are contrary to all mankind, forbidding us, to, at, forbidding the Gentiles to bring the gospel. But in, in, in the in the United States, in in Canada, if you would say something like that, you'd be thrown in prison, as you would in Austria, because actually, uh, laws on the books that you hate speeches is illegal in the United States. It it wouldn't be, but you would be. You would be so outside of sight if you ever said anything like that in the United States. So here, the entire responsibility for the death of Jesus is completely on the Jews. The Jews are the enemy of all that is good. I mean, look, anti-Semitism, these anti-Semites are not crazy. If I would read the Christian Bible without any nice guy commentary on it, I would hate me too. The people who think the Jews control the world and are basically the authors of evil in the world, they are, in a sense, Luther, who's a virulent anti-Semite, mm -hmm. the father of he was, And people have no idea how much he hated the Jews. Luther was completely rational. All the reformers hated the Jews. All the church fathers did. What they were doing is reading these screeds against the Jews, showing the Jews control everything. Pontius Pilate was basically a victim of the Jews who control the banks and Hollywood. And so. Where does that come from? Because you can see in the Gospels and the Passion narratives that the Jews are totally controlling Pontius Pilate and getting him to do what Pontius Pilate wants nothing to do with him, washes you, his hands of it. I have to but ask what, you on this while you mention of course, this. Of course people join the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> do you think... Uh, I had to yeah. poke this real quick here while you said this because I've heard this said. Do you think they really had influence on making Pontius Pilate crucify a man named Jesus? Or do you think this guy had to have done something to Rome and there was no money in the bowl trying to force him or oh, no. threats? Oh, no, no, no. Well, we know a lot about people who got crucified from Josephus 
we know a lot about it. People were crucified because it didn't mean that that um, that the empire had the kind of judicial system the United States does and cross-examination. The empire believed that you were a threat to the empire. That was it. There's a reason why the Roman Empire lasted for so long. It was a very, very successful empire. If you were subversive in any way, if they thought you were a threat, you were, you were crucified. This is... Yeah. This is un, this is not controversial, and therefore, if Jesus was crucified by the Romans, and I don't have a reason to to disbelieve that, he would be one of roughly two hundred thousand Jews during the first century who were crucified by the Romans. That's very unremarkable, mm. uh, and we we know it. We know a lot about this. You were not if you committed murder. You would be executed in the empire. They wouldn't be spending all that money on crucifying you. They were they were petrified of any subversive activity that posed a threat to Rome. Period. And that was it. There are other crimes, of course, but that was religious issues were very rarely a problem. There were some emperors who did persecute the Christians. The, um, there were some going Diocletian all the way through. Um, certainly, probably Nero did. We have Tacitus, so I'm sure of it. But um, but there was a sense, if we read the earliest references to Christianity, uh, let's say by Pliny the Younger, that Christians were gathering illegally and having these Get, you know, get into it. And the, the empire found it to be very subversive, very dangerous. That dates back to 112. That is what got, that's what got you crucified, was the empire thought you were a threat. This is not complicated. Okay. And I agree with you wholeheartedly on Paul. I didn't mean to interrupt, and, and I just had to get your thoughts on that because I had this idea that, you know, well, let's try and explain why Pontius Pilate crucified this innocent guy or some explanation. Well, they conspired and forced him. But side note, Paul, obviously, it it appears to me he's against the Jews over and over. Is he a Jew himself or is he is he claiming to be one? But he's probably a Herodian. What do you think? Look. <laughs> I, 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 no, I get, I'm going to no, write you a check after this. the show. There are a lot, a lot of books on this, a lot, a lot of stuff on this. There are some theories that there are some scholars who believe that Paul was really not Jewish. That's definitely not the consensus. The best book on this topic, which is an amazing read, is a book called The Myth Maker. Um, the, the subtitle is something like uh, Paul and the Invention of Christianity is written by a man named Hyam H Y H uh, Y A M I think Makobi with two C's in it. He, he passed away a number of years ago, so he he um, advanced that idea. I, I think that Paul is very clear. Paul was a a Greek thinker. He came from Tarsus. Tarsus was one of the Let's say the three centers in the in that period of for a Greek reflection and thought, not in Jerusalem. No one thought the way Paul did. And this is maybe why Jerome thought that Paul was born came from the Galilee rather than from Tarsus, because Tarsus would have been embarrassing. Um, so Paul's writings are not pharisaical at all, although this, I know for the viewers, you're going, what? But I'm told he was a Pharisee. That's because that's just the way people are repeating it over and over again. Right. But, but when you go through Paul's writings, nothing about Paul, his description of the resurrection of the dead, that's completely Greek. His thinking about the law, that's entirely Hellenized. Paul would have been very, cons would, would comport and the Gospels would fit very well with, with, um, with a Hellenized thinking, um, not with not with Judaism. Now he is certainly using the Jewish scriptures, as I've shown you on numerous occasions. Now, why would he know about the Jewish scriptures? Why would he know about Jewish traditions? So, think about today here. Just this one point. Yeah. 
everybody, Judy, the Jewish people, how many Jews are there in the world? 15 million. How many of them are Orthodox? I don't know, 3 million? As it turns out, Judaism is just about most, one of the most well-known religion in the world. In fact, the majority of the world's population relies on Judaism as its foundation, as its basis. People are most familiar with Orthodox Judaism. When you think about what do Jews do, you're not thinking about Bernie Sanders. I'm not politics. Think about a Jew who's observant. You can probably know about Shabbat, you know about Hanukkah. All these are Orthodox tradition. Now, the word Orthodox is only a couple centuries old, but I need to use conventional language. So as it turns out, people knew about the Jews, and the Jews were very important in the Greek and the Roman Empire. People knew about and wrote about us. That's what people know, just like today. People know. Now, people know much more today than they knew in the ancient world, but people knew these traditions. People knew about the law, but they were Hellenized. They were influenced. Was he Jewish? Probably he was. He fits very well into one of these um, radical Jews who really not Orthodox in any way, but are familiar with the text. And the familiarity, there's not depth here as it's as is often presented. There's no depth there. It's just quoting, using, te- misusing, misappropriating texts throughout the Jewish scriptures. That's it. That's actually, yeah, that's interesting. I, when I talked to Dr. Bob recently, he was saying it appears like he was misquoting on accident sometimes and stuff. But if you delve deeper into some of these contexts from you, this is why I really think we should do a Paul show, a particular Paul show. You can bring the ammunition with you to kind of show like in depth, some of Paul's theology and some of the issues you're finding with how he's quoting old Testament. That would be a great show. Would you, would you be interested in doing one? Of course. I mean, we're essentially doing this because right. I mean, we're doing this now and we certainly I'd be glad to, continue that. Paul is the most important convert to Christianity. Mm -hmm. And without Paul, Christianity would have never taken off. Paul made a a iteration of Judaism palatable to the Greek mind Mm -hmm. by using their ideas and using a rough Jewish um, thumb sketch. So it's... um, what what that's what we've been doing today. We, and although Hebrews was not written by Paul, he whoever wrote that book, and it's a very well written book, the Greek is whoever wrote that book would have gotten an A plus from Paul. It's Pauline. It's the same kind of thing. Paul is there to explain how it's all pointing to Jesus. And number two is he this is something that people miss is he is trying to explain why the Jews don't believe in Jesus. There's a problem. Why do the people who expect the Messiah can read the Bible, why don't they believe in him? Either they have a different view or they're they're blind, they're veiled, they're scales, they're shma, you know, Second Corinthians three and four. That's what Paul's explaining why. Dr. Rabbi, that book that you were talking about, yes, I put that inside of the link down below for anyone who's watching. It is going to be accessible on the Amazon link down below, as well as the, uh, Rabbi's books. So you guys be sure to go down there in the description. You guys can check out the books. You need to get it. I've got a copy actually right here. Let me grab it because it's really pretty. Hold on one second. Now, I know you don't like uh, spending too much time talking about this, but uh, you got to get these books. They're really big, easy to read, Volume 1 and Volume 2 of Let's Get Biblical. So you guys can hear a lot of what he's saying here. I mean, obviously, you don't talk about a lot of necessarily the Paul stuff here, but nonetheless, it, it, it's obvious when you go into Tanakh, he's going to show you why this is a total contrast to what you're seeing in the New Testament. And... uh I definitely can't wait when I have some downtime to delve through the whole book, but I just barely scratched the surface at the beginning. And I really am a very big fan of yours. I appreciate what you do. Uh, I really love the generosity. I know that you have no ill intent. Um, But look, this is what the world does, right? They poke at systems. They poke at your system. Your system might look and say, hey, your Christians have got things off. And you're the only one that I know of. I feel like it's good to have you around no matter what someone believes, especially 
if you're not a Christian, of course, Christians aren't going to like you because, you know, what you do is try to defend Judaism and show why it's the truth over Christianity. I I favor guys like you because who would I call who practices Judaism, who believes, who is a firm believer, who is orthodox, who's going to come out and outright discuss issues with Christianity? Like there's who am I going to call? It's not the Ghostbusters, so I had to call you. And I'm glad that you exist. I think it's important that men like you exist because this is a valuable and very important uh, tradition, heritage, everything. And you're pointing out very obvious things that even though I'm not a Christian anymore and I'm not a Jew, I'm not a practicing Orthodox Jew or anything like that, I see the same things you see in the New Testament. So I know that I'll get stones thrown at me as well by pointing out the obvious and I just, um, it's cool seeing you come on and say the same thing. It's not like because you're a Jew, because you're not a Christian, that you have to see the same things and say something. This is, I agree with you on these things. Like, there's something wrong here. And anyone who's watching this, most of my audience agrees. Like, Derek, you're preaching to the choir. Because they all agree there's something wrong with this. So, I really appreciate you joining me, though, Rabbi. And and uh, look forward to uh, more. It's a joy. I really enjoy it, Derek. And I thank you so much for having me on. I do. Hey, you. We're gonna hang out one day, and, and we're gonna record it. And I'm gonna come to Israel, and uh, we're right. gonna do in person hangouts and and do some recordings and stuff. I'll meet some of your family and friends, and it'll be awesome. But uh, anyone who's watching, go subscribe to his channel if you haven't already. You guys can see some of the stuff. He gets pretty confrontational sometimes. He's very kind, but. There's some stuff you need to see on his channel, so make sure you go subscribe. That'll be down in the description. And write me some questions. You guys have some tough questions. This rabbi is willing to take them. So thank you, Mr. Tovia Singer. Rabbi, I appreciate your time. Shalom.